this is Splice. You're listening to a recorded session from Splice Beta 2022 in Chiang Mai. We've edited this, but only slightly. Hey, this is Richard from Splice. In this one, our friend Steely Haralambus, the co-founder and CEO at The Daily Maverick, and he's talking about how they turned their mission statement into an action plan. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of The Daily Maverick in South Africa. I'm a reformed accountant in recovery. I helped establish Daily Maverick in 2009 with just five people. Uh, we've grown a little bit fr since then. Uh, we've focused on long-form journalism and investigations. And in 2019, we shared the Globe Global Shining Light Award for investigative journalism. So we've had some success and some learnings along the way as well. Today's talk is essentially about this. And I think this sums up my leadership experience as starting out at Daily Maverick and you know, the learnings along the way. And how our vision statement was something that evolved over time from this thing that we thought was just a, a corporate consultant uh, exercise into something that is a little bit more practical and actually evolved into quite a lot of stuff. But let's start off with, you know, what is a vision statement? It answers this question, where are we going and if we get there successfully, what does it look like, right? What do we expect to happen? What do we want to happen? What is this future state of success that we envision with our vision statement, right? And so how do we define something that helps us get there? Two of the most successful and powerful and well adhered to vision statements in history, according to me, uh, are these two. See if you can guess which organizations we're talking about or which organizations are. Okay, Patricia, I see you smiling. Which is the first one? Oh, sorry, it's Microsoft. Microsoft, there we go. Um, and the second one, who wants to take a guess? Amazon, right. So their labor practices aside, I mean, it's pretty incredible that David did so well and made this the focus of everything that they do is that almost every single action, every single strategy can be tied back to this. Does it is it in line with our vision? So it can be quite powerful in building these hugely innovative, massive corporations, keeping everything on track and focused around a single vision that is clearly defined and governs and gives direction to everything that they do. So what is Daily Mavericks? Daily is, this is Daily Mavericks' vision statement, right? No more, no better. We want people who spend time with our journalism to know more and know better, right? And so for a long time, as we were a small organization and you know, doing our guerrilla warfare thing in the world of digital media in the country, it was easy for that to sort of permeate everything that we do, we're a small organization. Uh, but then as we started growing, we thought, hey, let's just check in on this, right? Do people know what our vision statement is, right? Do they know what we stand for? And we did an employee survey and only 50% of the people in our organization could name and define our vision statement, which is obviously a little bit problematic, right? If we want to create that kind of focus, that kind of detailed and defined vision that was going to govern everything that we do, that you know, down to each article, could we go and judge this article to say, does this article help people know more? And do they know better after spending time with this journalism? That was the kind of state that we wanted to get to, that kind of environment, right? So, we needed to open up a can of change soup. And so we started this change program uh, that was born out of a, a desire to change. And so why did we need to change? Well, the first thing is, you know, we had grown by, by 4x to 120 people in the short space of time, something like three years. Uh, so we had experienced quite, quite a lot of massive growth. We were a distributed organization, have always been, so people all over the place. So we really needed to tighten things up strategically. And also is, is having this alignment, right? So uh, when you get stuck in the news business, obviously heavily focused on day-to-day -day operations, sometimes the why we do things, right? Why it's important and how we do things gets lost in what we do. And so we definitely noticed that it was time to start tightening things up and making sure that we were aligned on, on all of that. And we also were maturing as an organization, but we weren't maturing as a data-driven organization, or we're not fast enough to be able to incorporate data in our decisions. Obviously, it's a big aspect, a big movement happening in the news business now. 
is how can we use data to inform more of our decisions and our strategies and our innovations. And then also to provide the team with direction and guidance, right? So as a, a leadership team, uh, what we were trying to get to was this place where we could give people guidance on this direction of travel, these parameters in which you can work, and then giving people this carte blanche in between to proactively create with confidence, right? But in order to do that, we had to be clear about the direction of travel. We had to define the parameters and then give them that space and the agency to go and proactively create with that, right? And the vision statement was really key to all of this, right? So I was fortunate enough to participate in the first uh, executive media innovation program at CUNY. Muri, shout out there. And in this, they asked us to create a capstone at the end of our, our year of study. And my uh, capstone was, you know, how do we help, how do we transition from a startup organization into a medium-sized organization? How do we become more audience-centric and data-driven? And it resulted in a 60-page document. I think it was the longest of the year. The first thing was, though, once I'd done it and I thought about implementing this into the organization, one of the people I was working with said, you've got to change the title because it sucks, right? And so it went from data-driven audience interesty, which seemed like a great title for me and uh, people who are in the know. But if I was going to sell this to my team, if I was going to sell this to the sometimes cynical, sometimes skeptical anarchist slash journalists in the organization, I was going to need to come up with something. And so uh, we came up with securing our future, something that you know, everyone can buy into. And then you know, it was a lesson, an early lesson in, in, in how to sort of package a change program and how we can make it more uh, appealing and more uh, inclusive. So these were the four focus areas of the project, right? Which was, first, we wanted to become more strategic, right? To, to get that alignment of the why, the how, and the what, right? So what we choose to do, what we choose to invest our limited resources in, right? So it's a big thing, right? We're all stretched for, for time, we're all stretched for resources, we're all stretched for newsroom budgets and, and resources. So having that alignment will help us make um, better decisions and give us a, a better chance of success. The next thing was we really wanted to understand our audiences better, define them, define the niches, define the segments, and really understand the needs and the job that we needed to do with each of our editorial and technological products that we were rolling out. And then once we were doing that, we wanted to do data right, right? Once we had an understanding of what was important, what our vision was, where the overlap with the needs of our audience was, then only once we did that was it possible to now start measuring what matters. And that, what it, that's what we mean by doing, doing data right. And then once all of that is in place, then we can start building this organization that is familiar and comfortable with change, understands what it means to be continuously innovating and, and involved in something called ambidextrous innovation, which is exploring new things as well as getting more efficient in current operations. So this is the plan. Essentially, I was uh, thinking about it. How do we sort of visualize this overview? I was giving people an overview of, uh, of what we were going to uh, start up doing. And before we could even get into the Daily Maverick vision and mission, we had a session on like, what is journalism for? In 12 years of being in operation, we had never sat down as a team and debated and you know, came up with this answer, this very fundamental question of why do we exist as an industry, as an organization? What do we hope to achieve? And so we had to come up with a definition that was going to guide and inform all these other things that are built on top of that, right? So we literally were starting at the beginning again. And so we came up with our interpretation of what we believe journalism is for. And then on top of that, we could then elaborate on what the Daily Maverick vision and mission was, right? And so what journalism is for is something that should never change, right? It's, that principle should be, it should be timeless. You know, our vision and mission should change very rarely, right? Unless you're an organization that can you know, be around for 100 years and maybe, you know, move from being a paper mill into a mobile phone producer like Nokia did, your vision and mission shouldn't change, right, much. And then we would come up with these big editorial strategies that need to be aligned to our vision and mission and what journalism is for and, you know, how we decide to generate revenue. So as much as everyone told us a daily maverick soap on a rope would be a massive seller, like we didn't want to go down that road because it simply doesn't 
align with no more, no better, right? And so we would build on these things, and then we realized there was this gap between you know, each team having their own vision and strategy and the big vision and strategies and the editorial business strategies of the organization. And there was this, which was key editorial themes. And that kicked off at a really interesting exercise. Right, we've got the entire organization broken up into groups of five, everyone in, from finance to sales, from the most junior person to the most senior person was briefed with this task to go away look at the research and here were some suggested readings and come back with what they thought were the four or five most important editorial themes that Daily Maverick should invest its journalistic resources in for the next year, right? And so it was really interesting because this, this was another exercise that uh, we hadn't done as a national publication. We obviously, uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages of doing it like that, but really thinking about where should we put our resources and our effort into, into these themes that we could then center around, right? And so it was a really interesting exercise for a number of reasons. People got to work with other people they'd never met before. You know, uh, juniors were working with, you know, some of their stars and people that they, they really got in contact with. But also what was really interesting was to see how 70% of what they came back with was this massive overlap, right? So people had identified what was important for them as citizens uh, of a country, um, what their basic needs were, what their information needs were. And so we started a process of then being able to map out our efforts with the key editorial themes that then influenced section vision and strategy, team projects and goals. And only then, you know, only once we'd done all this hard stuff, were we now in a position to introduce metrics, data, and reports that informed how we were moving against the strategy that we had set, why we had chosen to invest our time and our resources into certain things, and how we were progressing against that, right? That overlap of the needs of the audience and our vision, and once we had defined that, where we now? And this kind of dawned on me as well, is this is why many digital transformation projects fail, is because a lot of places and a lot of Advisors will just come in and start going, hey, we're going to measure all of this, we're going to bring all this data, but we don't really understand why it's important, right? What is important? And so this was quite a nice overview for the team as we launched the project. So we embarked on this, the, this project. Another thing we learned on, on, on the course is that there actually is a model for managing change prog programs, right? There are these steps. Uh, one of the models is um, Cotter's change model. There's eight steps. And it was literally a case of, okay, well, we're going to map out these eight steps, right? We're going to and just put one foot in front of the other. We got some outside help. We planned a two-year change program that was going to help us to get in this. We identified new functions and new roles. And we just simply put each step and carried on. And I mean, we did this great simulation on the course, which was really helpful and, and really just highlighted that each change program, if you have a model you can follow, this increases your chances of success massively, right? And so that uh, kind of evolved as well. It evol evolved into um, a leadership uh, development program. Obviously, getting to now 120 people in the organization, things change from when you're just five people in the organization. Um, and so that means that we needed to start thinking about our future. We needed to start thinking about how we prepare the organization and the leadership to continue down the road, that the vision and the mission was still going to be central in all of this. And so we needed to invest in our team, in our leadership team, right? And so that involved a program. We engaged with outside consultants. They had this great model of leadership, which they introduced to us. Effectively, there's four areas of four leadership modes that you need to be doing. You need to be doing work on each of that. We did Enneagram profiles and, you know, where our natural strengths are and where our areas of of development are and how we engage with other people and how our minds think. And we did a lot of like visioning work, right? Like what is the future vision of success for each of our teams? What does it look like and what do we have to do to get from where we are now to where we are in this future state? In this fu and then, you know, building in things like team offsites away from the organization where we could go and dedicate a day and a half of just focusing on our leadership and not getting sucked into the operations of the of the news business that we're all familiar with. So how are we doing, right? And I, and I think this kind of, you know, this sums up uh, our progress, right? It's like when you start anything new 
and uh, it's going to work exactly like this, but in reality, it's more like this, right? It's jumbled, but as long as the, the movement is up and to the right, you can make it work. And there were times when it really felt like we were stuck in the mud, right? And, and really felt like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? I could see the blank looks. I could see the, the journos and editors in the room going, but we stuck with it, and I'm, and I'm glad we did because we've had some incredible success with it, and, and we've had some transformative uh, things happen for individuals, for the organization, on the organizational development front, on personal development, and people had you know, almost psychological breakthroughs because we had taken the time to invest in these kinds of things. We've won a, a lot of awards in our time uh, at the Daily Maverick. I've also won some personal awards, but I think this might be the, the crowning moment of my, my career in journalism. When one of our editors of our, of our life section said, hey, I've, you know, I've been think, playing around with all the stuff that we've done and this you know, strategic alignment and this and figuring out why we do things. And you know, we've come up with this matrix that's really helped us grow our, you know, our, our page views and, and really tighten up the way we do things and helps us as a small team. And she showed me this and I was like blown away you know, because she'd taken what journalism is for, the, the vision and mission of Daily Maverick, and then other sort of uh, key themes, so learning and development is a key theme, a need of self-actualization from Maslow's hierarchy of need, safety and belonging, which was another key theme, and then a, a sort of a historic view of what had done well uh, with page views. And then on this side, had taken the user needs, which is, uh, if you guys are familiar with the, the development of user needs and information needs in, in the news business, and sort of plotted them down here, and then these were the different sort of topic areas that they had written about from a life and culture point of view. And I looked at this, and first of all, I, like, I wanted to cry because, you know, we'd met, and this, this was so incredible for me. And then the next thing was I realized I looked at it and I said, hang on a second, but this, if I had plot it, why we cover it is up at the top. How we cover it is down the side. And then in the middle is what we cover, and it was this perfect sort of strategic alignment that we'd been aiming for at the beginning. And, and then we were just, you know, I was introducing this concept and you know, some of my cohort colleagues were like, wait, hang on a second, someone, an editor came up with this and she was incredulous that, you know, that, that we'd made such progress that someone was thinking about planning, editorial planning in such a strategic way. And then we had also discovered that um, J.K. Rowling had done a similar thing in plotting out uh, the Harry Potter books. And we can see like, you know, what that kind of strategic planning could do for nonfiction and fiction editorial and how, uh, how impressive it is. And so, I mean, that team, that, uh, the growth in that team has been, just been phenomenal. So other markers of success as a, as a leader in the organization, part of my job is to sense how things are going. When we started this project early on, I was getting the sense and also the feedback and you know, the, a lot of people were starting to get anxious, especially juniors, about the lack of direction and guidance that they were getting. There were some sort of complaints coming through about you know, the lack of organogram, which is uh, not really what the problem was and there were different things coming back that were a bit problematic, and, and as we went through this process, we, like, that started to change, right? So I could sense things that started to change, the language that we were using uh, in day-to-day in -day terms, a lot of Enneagram stuff was starting to come into it, um, a lot of vision and mission stuff, and you know, hey, does this tie into what the vision is, right? Can we tie this back to a key theme? How are we thinking about success you know, before projects start? Right? What is our hypothesis? So all that stuff was starting to come back. We also were getting, um, at the beginning of COVID, we employed a dedicated uh, counselor to help our team uh, through COVID. And, and so I think that was one of the, the best sort of uh, reactive things we could do to support our staff in COVID. And, and every month we sort of get a very high level um, uh, feedback from, from him in terms of the kinds of things that people are struggling with, right? And so it went from being, com sometimes there were complaints about us, but it, it sort of started reducing to like, you know, just complaints about the world and people struggling with what the world was. And so we were getting all these different markers back and, and surveys were starting to show that um, things were shifting, right? 
And then this also had become a case study, right? We, we were like, this was a case study for a small organization that had implemented a change project. Usually it's just the, the big guys who have the ability to get external help and resources and plan something like this. But I think it's quite impressive that a medium-sized organization was able to do this as well. And in that is obviously what happened to our audience in that time. So monthly unique visitors isn't just the measure of success. We have others that we look at, but obviously this is one of them, right? The top of the funnel for us. And in the time from when we started uh, in August 2021, rolling out the, the, the training to the different teams, was that we had almost tripled our audience size in the space of a year. As I said, it's not the one measure of success, but you can do a lot with this kind of growth, right? And that was with not changing anything massive. It was just about tightening up, being more strategic in our decisions, doing more work to understand the needs of our audience. For the first time, looking at research and data that might inform where we choose to invest our time and resources. And it's not just, you know, obviously it wasn't just this project that influenced this, this huge growth, but there were a couple of other things that did that, but it was the, the foundation, right? It was we were starting to create a new way of working within the organization that was going to be the foundation for everything else. So when I show people this graph, everyone wants to know, okay, how did you do that? What else can you do? So I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper into that. And there were three areas, right? It was... First of all was the strategic work that we were doing. Second layer on top of that was some more tactical things. And the third one was purely just technological, right? And so if we sort of come look at how, where we started in this presentation, how a vision statement of knowing more and knowing better and what that can then spur us to do when we follow through with all of that is we end up in, in something like this. And so what that looks like at a more detailed level was you know, strategically, we were doing these things. We were focusing on original journalism and why we were choosing to do things, right? We were also focusing on the culture and the training in the newsroom, investing in our newsletters, which had always been an engine room for our organization, both from an audience growth, from an advertising revenue, and from a membership perspective. And we started really getting clarity on introducing these concepts of vision, mission, and key themes into editorial planning, right? So not at the end, not just something we just report on. It was like, at the beginning, why are we going to do this and how are we going to do this, right? And so those influences were starting to impact on commissioning decisions up front. And then we created new roles. Like, we realized that we needed a dedicated audience development person to build on the work that each of the of the section heads and other people involved in, in audience development we're looking at, but having that single dedicated resource to be able to interpret the daily movements according to these strategic imperatives was massive, right? And so there's a daily note that goes out in the morning that says, hey, this key theme did well yesterday. We did it with this lens, this user need. How about we do a follow-up with this user need? You know, or this did really well on search what could we do to maybe, you know, do something on social with this thing? So having that dedicated person with a journalistic background has been key to sort of changing that dynamic of how we think about measuring our progress on a daily basis and, and, and beyond that. And then also the work we did on leadership development, which is important, right? A leadership isn't something that, well, it's something that few people are blessed with naturally, but it is something that is a skill that can be taught there are some great coaches out there. We've been very lucky to work with a great organization that's helped us develop our leaders. And we're really starting to see how that is starting to then permeate into their teams and just doing simple things that are, that are really making massive improvements for us. So some of the tactical things that we were doing, we became better at planning and measuring success, right? And so going into not launching projects anymore without saying, hey, what are we expecting this thing to do for us? And why is that important? Right? And defining that up front before we launch projects and then realizing, hey, it's either shooting the lights out or it's not. What are we going to do to tweak that? So just little practices like that. Those daily notes that I mentioned from our audience development, we started scoring our headlines. Uh, just, you know, we uh, score it for readability. We did an analysis of uh, the top 1,000 best-performing articles on our site and found out 
hey, 85% of these have a certain a number of words in them. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, and then linking into some other databases to score it. And so now every article has a, every headline has a scoring. We've invested in, in SEO improvements. And, and then we also started monitoring articles that were doing well that weren't on our home page. We're going, oh, shit, this article, let's stick it back on the home page. And so there were things like that. And then ordering our article, sorry, ordering our home page by page views in the last 30 minutes of putting the greatest chance of uh, those articles doing well at the top of the home page. Uh, and then breaking down the information walls and barriers between teams, right? Sometimes there's duplication of efforts, sometimes there's collaborations that could happen. Um, and really, as we, you know, grown and been working more remotely, that started becoming a bigger problem. So we responded by doing that. And then some technical things as well. We did a, a code audit when we moved on to a new hosting platform. Three months auditing code, five years of code that... Uh, was really frustrating to go through because we were paying for the service. But once we got on there, the site speed had, had improved so much. And we know, all know that page speed makes a huge difference to search rankings, for example. So there's a continuous investment in, in improving our page speed. Another one is we turned off AMP. And what happened? Our search traffic went up. So uh, if there are any Google people in the room, well, that was our experience. And, uh, uh, and so it was continuously testing and monitoring things, way of, of, of getting better, and we'll be building a, a daily Maverick theme and, and optimizing our images and, and doing script orders. So very technical kind of stuff, but you know, these are the things that the, the building blocks that need to, be, need to be in place. So if I can leave you with one thought and uh, something from my generation where memes are still cool, is, um, is really this, right? You guys are at this conference, you're getting a lot of information, and even this concept of a vision statement being something that isn't just a theoretical statement, right? If we can turn that information into action, that's what we need to do, that is a real superpower, right? And it doesn't even have to be turning rocket science into action, which is a superpower, I, yes or no, but even little things, like right? just taking one step forward, doing something proactively, getting a team in an offsite, deciding on, uh, hey, what is our game plan? Why are we doing this? Why do we... What are we hoping to achieve with this, right? And so really leaving you with this thought that, you know, it's, uh, it's great. We're here. We're soaking up this knowledge. But what can you take from this presentation? What can you take from this conference? What are you going to take back and turn into action? Thank you. time for questions. So, questions, comments, insults? Thank you for your presentation. You know the slide that you showed of the editor who had done the matrix, that really matrix, complicated yeah. diagram. There were some, uh, I guess, topic areas or themes that they report on that were in bold. Does that mean that were those indicative of the ones that kept coming up and was there an editorial decision made on, off the back of that? So did they decide we're going to do less gardening content and do more well-being because it keeps coming up across the, like, what was the decision that was made off the base or what was the action taken off the back of the information? So the bold is really just me playing around with the, the slide. <laughs> it's, it's, that's one level too deep on, so, so don't read anything into that. The fact that gardening could end up in multiple places means that you can write about it or create in a different way, you know, through a different angle, through a different lens and multiple, you know, is this about educating people or is this about giving people a new perspective or is it about, you know, can you write about it in a way that diverts people from the daily noise of corruption, right? So maybe a satirical piece. So it's really just about recognizing that you can write the same story in multiple different ways, but still being aligned with, you know, why we're doing that, right? Which is where that plot of, of, of the vision and the mission at the top and go, well, can we write about this? Can we write about gardening in a satirical way that still helps people know more and know better about gardening afterwards, right? And so that has really helped them sort of uh, crystallize and, and to clarify how they approach it and why they approach it. And also when they get new people who join the team, they're able to explain sort of their 
mission for their team using this matrix in a lot more clarity. And, and, they, and they say that um, you know, people really appre it's really easy for them to see how it all fits together as opposed to you know, like a, a long document or not even having anything like that as well. So it's really useful for onboarding as well as also editorial planning and, and monitoring success as they go along. And the key themes exercise, for example, is something that we plan to do every year. So those key themes might change in response to the needs of the country. And also each team is tasked with then taking those key themes and then interpreting them for their section. Because obviously the climate change team, the business team, and the life and culture team are all going to have different interpretations and maybe different priority areas of, of where they focus and weight their efforts. So, you know, a, a sustainable world is one of the key themes that we have. And so, you know, the business team might, ha might have, you know, more or less of a weighting than the lifestyle team with regards to how, and how they interpret a sustainable world as a key theme in their focus area versus versus uh, the other sections. Thanks. Um, that was really interesting. I was wondering whether your biggest barrier was culture change and how you essentially brought the journalists on side because without them, you couldn't achieve what you needed to. Mm. Yeah, with any change project, um, that's always resistance to change is one of the biggest things that you will face. But if we go back to this model, um, you'll see step number two is forming a powerful coalition. So we're still quite lucky in that we're still co-founder-led after 13 years, and so you know, we, we're at a stage where the organization is big enough that it needs to change, but we still have the co-founders there, so, and we can form a coalition around that. So you know, getting my co-founder and partner on board was probably the first step in, in this process because this was also a little bit foreign. I'd, I'd spent a year kind of you know, working through this and studying through this, so it, it seemed a natural fit to me that we needed to do this, but you know, I had to get him on board, right? And so starting from there, and I think that's how it starts, is, is, is sharing the vision with people that will help you succeed in rolling this out, and obviously, uh, and there's even some research to, to, to show that the most successful innovation programs out there and, and change programs need to have the support of leadership and sometimes the involvement of leadership as well, senior leadership in making that happen. So we'd gone out and, and it was first with, with Branka, my partner, and then beyond that was selecting a couple of senior people in the newsroom to come on board and be part of the sort of the planning focus, having a town hall to announce it, sharing the vision with the entire organization and also why we were doing it, right? And then the other thing was making sure that it wasn't a top-down change program. Like, you will do this and this is what we are going to do. No, we involved as many people as possible. We started off, you know, interviewing people who wanted to be part of the process, doing the key themes exercise, which was the entire organization was involved in. And so there was a lot of reward for people going, geez, I'm, you know, I've been here three months and I'm already being asked to participate in something that is going to be this massive strategic focus for the organization for the next year. And so that has a, a big impact on people's attitude towards wanting to change and being open to change and being part of the process. And so, yes, there are still some people who were a little bit cynical and maybe even still are a little bit cynical, but the successes are now starting to roll in that there's no more debate about whether we should be heading down this road or not. Right? And so it's a little bit of a chess game, and, and, but what's great is that there's a map now, right? And just follow these steps and plan it, and, and we were lucky to get a little bit of external help in that process. But you know, this was a, a real eye-opener for us you know, when we were doing the course. I think everyone in the course, when we saw this, was, oh, my God, that's why all of our change programs have failed. You know, we just thought we, there was no plan, right? And so that really helped. Thanks for sharing. I was actually going to ask about the change as well. I think uh, these, having these uh, processes and having a kind of methodical understanding of this is very helpful. What were the cultural challenges um, typical to your organization? And uh, the next part of the question is, with the two-year experience you have gained uh, with the change you have implemented in your organization, which has turned out to be really amazing from outside. Uh, what, what kind of advice would you have given to that two-year younger version of Stilly? Thanks. Okay, so the, the, the two questions were, were the cultural changes, were they indicative? 
Yeah, so I mean, just really the resistance to change is the first one. It's like, how do you get resistance to change out of the way? How do you get everyone into the canoe uh, is a saying that, that uh, people like to talk about. And, uh, and also people who are working individually, people who are working remotely, people who might not, you know, see this stuff day in and day out. And then all of a sudden, you know, the CEO pops his head up and says, hey, everything we're doing now is changing. And also I think one of the, the, the biggest or a big challenge in that was if you'd looked at our trajectory and our growth and how things were going, you wouldn't have said this is an organization that is struggling and that needs to change because it's not working. So it took a little bit of, of sensing the other things that were happening, seeing the opportunity of what it could be rather than what we were currently going to really go, actually, you know what, this isn't, we might be doing okay now, but it's taking a lot of effort to get these results, and it shouldn't be this difficult. There's a better way here. And I think that's what the change was about, is like if we get these things in place and we implement them, also hopefully it will run better for longer without us being around. You know, and so one of our greatest fears is, you know, what is this place, how does this place run when we're not around as co-founders or even some of the other senior leaders in the, in, in the team, right? Like, is it just going to, and there was definitely that sense was like, if we stepped away right now, how long would it take? It would take months probably before this thing starts going in the other direction. And that's something that really, really scared us. I mean, like after all this work, after all these years, uh, and, and that is one of the jobs of leadership is like, how do you create plan for succession and continuity beyond the existing effort? I've forgotten the second part of the question, sorry. Oh, the advice for two years ago? Yes. Yeah, that, uh, that it's just going to take longer than you expect. I mean, we planned for two years, which was a fair amount of time. But, you know, even the plan, the project plan that we put together, we were always behind the project plan. But that was okay because we're balancing the current operational needs and demands and, and the stresses of the organization and where people were and... You know, and also that we started this in COVID as well. Like COVID was still happening. The effects of COVID were still playing out. And so it was still kind of ambitious to do that, but it just, just to, to measure that pace, right? And, and I think we, by and large, we got it okay, but there, was a, there were a couple of people who were so excited. Okay, when are we doing this? Like, just, just calm down. Like things will break if we go too fast here because we're always, you know, as everyone who works in a news environment knows, we're... Most times we're redlining, right? And so you've got to know when to be able to kind of push and when to, to measure the pace of the program. Um, how much has membership grown with the transition and also with the audience growth? Um, how much of it contributed to membership growth strategies? Yeah, so there, there's, because we run a voluntary membership program, and again, the membership program is tied to the vision, no more, no better. So how can... You know, how can people know more if our stuff is behind a paywall, right? And so that influenced the decision of, of uh, the kind of reader revenue program that we got into. And so with voluntary membership, there's a, a, a longer lead time into conversion. So we won't see a 3x growth in membership in a year because of this. But what it's going to do is going to continue feeding. So I think we, in the time since we started, we've had about a, a 30 or 40% growth uh, in membership in, in that time. Um, but our sort of our funnel, our middle of the funnel has, uh, has I think, grown by about 80%. And so that's going to continue to feed our membership program going forward. So it was all, it's all kind of linked and we've got a plan and we've got a plan to convert new people into returning users and returning users into registered users and then into, into membership. And then also once they're into membership is the job of retention starts and then also bringing in new products and services as that base grows. So we're just under 20,000 members at the moment uh, who support us monthly and a uh, monthly or annually and you know the plan is to to get that to 30 and 100,000 as quickly as possible hi um, i was wondering if you start from what is journalism for you might end up with something that is in contrast with your main revenue streams couldn't you and how how do you balance that out and especially if you say measure what matters uh, if i mean if impact of an investigation is hard to transform into revenue, is it still something that it's important to measure? And can you turn that into a success factor also for, for sustainability in a way? Yes, yeah, a great question is um, if your interpretation of what journalism is for um, results in 
choices or revenue that you've already chosen to do, but there's a contradiction, and I'll give you a great one, is BuzzFeed, right? A couple of years, well, a year ago, they launched um, BuzzFeed ice cream and a BuzzFeed sex toy. And at the time, I was thinking, well, the, the clue's in the name, right? BuzzFeed. Um, but um, <laughs> I, was, I was also thinking, like, how is that aligned? What is their vision statement that makes them think that that's... And look, they're funded as a you know, private equity-funded organization, and basically their mission is to be profitable. Like, that's all I could get to, right? And so you're going to end up taking decisions because essentially what guides everything they do is making a profit, right? And so we believe that eventually one day we will be profitable, but because of this other stuff, the, the profit is the byproduct of knowing more and knowing better. We're a hybrid organization, so we've got a non large non-profit uh, part of our corporate structure. So that allows us a little bit of flexibility, but I think at its essence, in, 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 you know, if you look at Microsoft's vision statement and Amazon's vision statement, it's nothing about profit, right? It's about delivering a product or a service that is better than anything else in the world. And because they do it so well... Uh, no, no, I, I, like, I honestly believe that they, they knew that if they did that so well, they would eventually get there and they would eventually be making crazy amounts of money. But it's not like... I honestly believe that, that those vision statements did guide everything that they, they, they did to create those incredible services. And obviously, labor practices that helped them do that. But that's, you know, slightly different. Sorry, what is the second part of the question? No, no, no it's just like how, how do we balance... Uh, and then measuring impact me on... Yeah, this measuring um, what is important for, for your vision of journalism with uh, harmonizing it with what generates enough revenue that keeps you yeah. sustainable, not profitable again. Yeah, so, so measuring what matters and, and framing it in that term it was also important because we've, we haven't come in and told each of the teams what to measure and what is important. We've said, look, these are the foundational principles that guide what we do, and you now need to take all of this and you need to determine what to measure and what's important, right? So if, for example, now investigations is a good one, right? How do you measure impact? But let's say, you know, we decided there are these four key themes, right? A sustainable world, learning and development, uh, accountability, and I can't remember the other one off the top of my head. But now the investigations team, if they want to measure what's important, they can go, you know, we haven't really done that many investigations on the education sector. So we're going to do at least five investigations this year on education. And that's what they're going to measure because it's important. They go, that, the measure what matters is we will do five. Not we will do five with 100,000 page views. They're just going, we're now going to change what we're going to, and then we're going to measure the impact of that and see are there policy changes, are people, you know, uh, fired, are pe you know, do people resign, are they, well, you know, exactly those kind of things. But we're not saying to them that the measure is page views. We're saying to them, you go out and you determine what is important based on all this foundational work and guidance that we've provided and that we've all collaborated on. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do donors of the nonprofit part react to this, uh, you know, um, arbitrary choice of measurements? Because very often we, we get asked for numbers. Uh, right. Uh, no, we don't work with foundations like that. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. in any case, it's, yeah. it's all, there's no revenue. No, no, we do get, we do get um, um, some foundation revenue, but we have generally struggled with uh, foundations that are overly, that overreach and that we struggle to get on with. So we basically just cut them out of the mix and we just work with ones that are, give us a lot more flexibility to just do what we're doing. And obviously they see the success in what we're doing and so they, we have a good relationship with them on that front. But, but we'll, we'll have large sort of like, we'll, go, we'll do stuff in this area and we'll do sort of a minimum, or we'll in, do a minimum number of investigations in, in you know, climate change, for example. And so we give them like a, a sort of a broad spectrum thing up front, we over deliver and they're happy, you know, so. Okay, thank you so much. Um, actually, I had similar question too, and you already answer most of, the, of it um, about balancing, you know, balancing the journalism and uh, income generation. Um, I see the slide that you show about audience growth efforts and the strategic part you put, I can see most, most of it like, quite good, like original uh, journalism, uh, growing newsroom, and also like investing in data. But from my experience, this focus might not be 
the best thing for income. So how did you decide it on that uh, low strategic point? Did you uh, have any survey with the audience? And or you just like decided just to focus on this and then you use the tech technical and technical part to help you to achieve the audience uh, growth? Honestly, I, I think if you get these things right, then you should have a better chance of generating income, you know, from different opportunities. If you're growing as an organization, if you are uh, more strategically aligned, if you're interpreting and using data in a better way than before, you should see the increases in reach, engagement, loyalty, that can then be converted into financial support in some way, whether, whether that's membership or advertising. So, you know, but for us, very few media organizations in, in our region are investing in these things, right? Because they're hard. Like, you know, in, I think it was Jeff Bezos that said, you know, strategy is the answer to the question, you know, what is the hardest thing that we can do? And, and by implication that our competitors aren't doing, right? And so um, investing in all this stuff was, you know, it takes vision, it takes budget, but if you believe in it and you believe in the returns that it can generate, and that's what we did was, and proven to do as well. So in our case, it did prove to be successful and to be a successful return on investment on all of these things. You know, even investing in a counselor that we pay for for our team. You know, like more than a third of everyone in our organization has met with the counselor at least once. I think more than a third need to meet with him still, but um, we're getting there. And the impact of that has been, has been phenomenal for the overall well-being of our organization. And investing in data as well, like at the right time. Once the foundational strategic stuff has been done and the overlap between our vision and the needs of the audience has been ascertained, only then can you really, like, really get the impact of investing in data. We've done audience surveys, but it's also important to do the high-level stuff, and so that key themes exercise is basically doing an assessment of the needs at a national level, and then you look at research, then you look at analytics, then you look at, even in that, in, in that exercise, we ask people to go look at the national budget of the country, right? What is the country spending money on? And then we said, now, what do you spend money on in your own personal budget? And I, a bunch of people came back and they said, geez, the country spends 20% of its budget on education. 50% of corporate CSI goes to education. A big chunk of my household budget goes to education. And you know what? South Africa is one of the most underperforming education sectors in the world for the amount of money spent. And I think in the country, there's one journalist dedicated to education in the whole country. And so we're like, shit, big gap here, right? So that exercise, uh, looking at the data, looking at research was quite instructive because we've never done that before. Hi, just a okay. kind of uh, practical question. How do you manage to do all of this <laughs> while you are doing your daily job in, in the daily? And uh, do you have like a special team or it's, uh, yeah, how, what team is in charge of following this? And you said that you work with the, the leadership program, you did it with a group of consultants or something like that. Did you have other consultants working with you or helping you with all of that? Yeah, so first of all, like how do I fit this in uh, as part of the day job? The first thing is prioritizing, right? It's like if I don't make this a priority now, if I don't m put this right at the top, it's not going to happen. And then the long-term consequence of that. So it's really just about thinking okay, long-term, what is the best for the organization? And then realizing this is important and it's urgent, even though it's long-term. And so I have to now work differently. My job, my role has evolved over time. And that has been one of the hardest things for us to realize because when you start out uh, from a team of five, you're like hands-on involved in everything, right? From loading campaigns to selling to putting the finances together, raising fundraising, to writing even. So like it's recognizing that, um, that comfort that you get from doing the same thing day in and day out is not where you're going to get the long-term gains, especially as in my role. Um, so I had to prioritize it. Um, and then, you know, we didn't get full-time external help. They were done, there were two 
Uh, first of all, there was a leadership planning people, so a leadership uh, program, and so we worked with them, and they they put together a program over the course of a year that would would help us. And each of the offsites are basically driven by them, and I do a little bit of extra. And then we hired a sort of a part-time newsroom consultant to help with the actual change program. So his job was to make sure that the change program was moving forward, that we had a plan, that the documentation was being put together, that the meetings were set up, that the follow-up from the meetings were there. And that was just a part-time person who worked with us a couple of days and didn't break the budget. And then the planning team around that, we sort of shared the load, but I was integral to that whole thing to make sure that the, you know, the importance of it was never lost, that the momentum was, was never lost by having these additional resources in place and having that vision. And you know, the, um, one of the things I learned on you know, a, a CEO's job is basically to be a CRO, the chief repeating officer, right? <laughs> because, because people don't listen, you know, they do listen, but it has to be repeated over and over again so that you elevate the importance and that, they go, oh, he's talking about that thing again, oh, you know? But th that it's there and it's important and also holds ourselves accountable and we keep to a, a plan and program and we don't just let it slide away because we're not talking about it. Oh, hi, um, I just want to ask about your membership and so how and you know you go about you know the decision on what type of membership you go. I mean, you you did like a donation one, so you know I just want to know the process and you know your thinking behind that, whether you know yeah. Uh, well, on on you know, your market. I, I think this probably needs to be our last one. I think we almost ran out of time. But um, how we got to a membership program was we knew we didn't want to put up a paywall. We knew in a country with 35% unemployment um, that we couldn't just keep our journalism for those who could afford to pay. And when we were thinking, we knew, but we knew we had to get into reader revenue, right? The only organizations in the world that were growing and feeling optimistic about it were ones who'd cracked reader revenue. And so what was a version of that that we could do? And so I spoke with my partner and I said, hey, we've got to do this reader revenue thing. And he said, no, we're not putting up a paywall. I said, don't worry, there's this new thing called membership that I think could work for us. And there was some research that had been released. And, uh, and I said, you know, and he says, fine, as long as we don't have a paywall, just go and you know, put it together. And you know, we basically just highlighted this entire document. It was called Audience Engagement and Revenue by uh, Emily Goligoski and Elizabeth Hansen, two women who have changed my life on multiple fronts. But uh, that document and the follow-up work on that uh, helped us design a membership program that could keep it free and that we could also then design uh, a program that was more than just donation. It was, right, it was about creating a community and serving that community who wanted a more engaging relationship with news, who wanted to join our cause, who had similar values, who wanted to support us financially, but also get involved in a bunch of other ways of supporting us, right? And so sharing their superpower with us, and then we do things with that, and we you know, have new sources and people who want to be involved in our events, and that spurred on engaged journalism efforts fr from that. So that's pretty much how we got, but starting with the vision that you know, we want people to know more and to know better, and how could they know more and know better if we keep like a really good journalism for those who can afford to pay? And so there was that strategic alignment coming through again there that really worked well for us, and it's so easy for everyone to get behind when that alignment is there and, and clear for everyone to see. Cool, thanks everyone. I think uh, we're done there, thank you. <laughs>